Thank you, Keith. Can everybody hear me okay? Appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and talk to you a little bit about a couple of grazing experiments that I've got going on here at the, um, at the Noble Foundation. I'll run quickly through that. Um, this is a, a Landsat imagery of, of the southern Great Plains and the red circle there is a hundred mile radius of Ardmore. And then if you can see the star there is north of the uh, Red River, that's Ardmore where we're sitting now. <clears throat> so this is a crop data layer that we took a couple years ago, or downloaded a couple years ago. So you can see the type of uh, farming activities that we do in, the, in our part of the world. So the dark areas are um, Dallas-Fort Worth, Metroplex down in the south, Oklahoma City to the north. You can see the Red River moving along there. The green is the wheat belt in the western part of the state. <clears throat> the red areas is kind of in the southwestern corner of the state, the cotton area. And as Lisa mentioned earlier this morning, kind of the green, light greenish areas, that's pasture and rangeland or forages. So that's what we do in our part of the world. We grow forages and we run cattle. Uh, on our wheat acres, our rotation is typically wheat. We rotate till next year and plant wheat, and we rotate till next year and we plant wheat. That's our typical rotation here in, the, in our part of the world. So that, that gets us interested in the possibility and use of, of cover crops and how we can incorporate cover crops into grazing situations or into grazing systems. Another thing that we do in, in, a, in our part of the world, <clears throat> how many of you know the, the great composer Ray Stevens? How many of you have heard of him? You know, he's, he's had classics like Everything is Beautiful and uh, the Mississippi Squirrel Revival, uh, The Streak, things like that. How many of you remember the haircut song? Remember that? By Ray Stevens, the haircut song. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why this popped into my head while I was sitting here listening to uh, talks earlier this morning. I don't know why things like that pop into my head, but they do. And I remember part of that song, the character of the song winds up in Montana somewhere and he's getting a haircut. <laughs> the barber grabs him, throws him in the chair, spins him around, slaps him a couple times and says, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a logger because he wanted to sound tough. I think a lot of our producers in our part of the world, and especially down in North Texas, if you travel down in, in that area, if they were grabbed, thrown in that barber's chair, spun around a couple times, slapped a couple times, and said, what do you do for a living? They said, I plow. <laughs> and we like to plow too. I like to plow. <laughs> I enjoy plowing, but I'm trying to limit my plowing activities to my garden. But how can we, we incorporate cover crops into our grazing? systems that we have here. So what we've, I'm going to talk to you about two studies that we've got going on. One I call the summer cover crop study. <clears throat> and the history of, of this is we have a, a hundred acre uh, field at one of the Noble Foundation farms west of Ardmore, about seven miles west of, of where we are right now. The history is for the past 12 years you can see that this area is broken into uh, paddocks each one of those paddocks is 10 acres apiece. So we have 10 10 acre paddocks. Half of those paddocks about 12 years ago were, were randomly assigned to either a tillage or a no-till treatment. So for the past 10 or 12 years, we've planted winter pasture out there, which has typically been rye, mixture of rye, rye grass, using conventional methods or no-till methods. And it's been summer followed. So we have a good history of the cropping activities that have occurred on this area. The, the soil type is, is a loam, silt loam type soil, and typically we'll summer follow that. We don't grow anything out there during the summer. So our tillage areas, we'll go in and plow them during the summer. Our no-till areas will chemically follow. And then we'll come in sometime in September, plant our winter pasture, and we'll graze with stalker cattle. 
So the objective of this study is we want to measure the impact of a summer cover crop on our winter pasture production. Because that's the livelihood of a lot of our producers here is we grow wheat pasture, we graze it with stocker cattle. If we grow a summer cover crop, we want to know what impact is that going to have on our winter pasture production, on our grazing days and the, and the forage mass. We also have an inter interest, interest in knowing what the incorporation of that summer cover crop is going to have on our soil health characteristics and water use. How much water is this summer cover crop actually going to use during the summer and what impact is that going to have on the establishment and growth of our winter pasture. And finally, economics are the, is the main driver of everything that we do. We want to understand what the economic impact of incorporating that cover crop into our existing winter pasture system is going to have. Is it going to be profitable? Is it going to increase our overall profitability? Is it not going to change it? Or is it going to decrease it? We look at this, uh, this area a little bit closer, and this was supposed to be an animated slide, but I don't think it's going to animate. Uh, where we originally had 10 10-acre paddocks, we've now split those in half, so now we have 25-acre paddocks. Half are in tillage, half are in no-till. Half of those, uh, uh, all those paddocks, <laughs> We'll have 25 acre paddocks that are going to get a cover crop, the other half will not. So we'll have kind of a factorial design where we'll have no till, till, cover crop, no cover crop. The little blue dots, to measure our soil moisture, we're actually going to go out there and we're going to put in soil moisture sensors at three different depths. So those sensors are going to be collecting moisture information or moisture readings about every two hours. So over a season, we're going to amass quite a large data set of soil moisture. The cover crop mixture that we're going to use is, is what's shown here, mixture of cowpeas, uh, soybeans, sun hemp, pearl millet, a couple pearl millets there, grazing corn and a buckwheat. We kind of base this on a Haney soil test. Um, we got those results back, looked at what it said and the recommendations and then kind of built, built this mixture based off of that. Currently for the last year we've kind of been taking some uh, baseline information out there so we'll know where we're starting. One of the things that we did is, is we went out and we did soil test. <clears throat> this is just kind of where we're at, just looking at average of those no-till paddocks and till paddocks, looking at organic matter, uh, the Haney soil test nitrogen, a traditional uh, nitrogen test, the carbon burst, and a soil health reading. I think what's interesting is you can see a little bit of a difference there in the organic matter between the till, the no-till areas. Of course, that relates to our, our nitrogen availability in the soil, a little bit of difference there between those two. Um, carbon, fairly good uh, carbon content of those soils. I, I was relatively pleased and somewhat surprised that they, that they are that high. And then we have a base soil test uh, health measurement score there. And we're going to be monitoring that over time. Every year we're going to do that at least once or twice per year. Right now, <clears throat> we're grazing winter pasture. Uh, we have a seeding, we've seeded 100 pounds per acre. Of, we seeded 90 pounds per acre of wheat and then another 25 pounds per acre of cereal rye. This is an unusual year for us here that we had a tremendous amount of rain the first part of the year and then it turned off hot and dry. I think we had something like 60 inches of rain by the first of July and then it quit, absolutely quit for the next three months. Um, and turned off hot and dry so, so normally we like to get our winter pasture planted in September, maybe late August. We were literally, despite all the rainfall that we had, we were sitting there waiting on it to, uh, to rain enough that we could get a disc to run in the ground. So we didn't get our pasture planted till very late September, early October, so we're about a month behind where we normally would be. 
But we've been taking uh, monthly pasture reading, forage mass readings out there, monitoring the development of that pasture. You can see we started those uh, readings early November. The red is no-till mass and the blue is tillage mass. So we have a little bit of separation that began sometime in that net late November where our, we're getting just a tick more production off our no-till than we are our tillage. I don't have any st statistics on this yet, um, but I will say that uh, we, might, we measured almost the exact same pattern last year that um, our no-till began to separate from our till, produced a little bit more forage for us. We turned stocker cattle in the uh, 15th of December, and we're continuing to weekly monitor that forage mass every, um, every week, and we'll continue to do that through the grazing season. Another thing that we did uh, late fall, right prior to planting, is we went out and we actually put a soil structure score on all these paddocks, till and no-till. Uh, I don't have those scores, but this is what you do is you go out and, and actually uh, do some shovelomics out there. You do a lot of digging and looking, and then you'll uh, put, a, put a score on the, on the soil structure. Uh, based on the ped, uh, ped, ped size and some other factors there. But I just wanted to show you that um, we have no-till soil structure. Each one of these uh, bladefuls of shovel on the no-till is from a different paddock. And then this is kind of what the tillage soil structure looked after we had plowed it. So it's, it's kind of hard to score that after you plow it. But you can see some differences there on our no-till soil structure compared to our tillage. The tillage doesn't show up very well. Typically, our tillage is we'll run a, an offset, a heavy offset disc at least twice and then follow that up with a field cultivator. Um, on the very bottom edge of that tillage, you can go in there and we do have a plow pan layer and it comes up here. Um, it doesn't show up very well, but we do have a plow pan layer. That's very evident when you, when you go and do a little bit of digging. Kind of our, our timeline that we're going to be going by for this study. Uh, <clears throat> this year our winter pasture was planted in October. It's a month late. Normally we'll plant it by the September 15th. We'll hope to, hopefully this year will be a little bit more of a normal year, whatever that means. Um, and we'll be back on track with that. <clears throat> we stocked our pasture at one acre, one calf per acre December 15th. And that would be, those caves averaged 550 pounds per acre. Uh, so that was our stocking rate. At the time that we turned out, we had on average about 1,300 pounds of forage available per acre. We're gonna get our soil moisture sensors put out. We definitely wanna have them in place and taking readings by the time we plant our cover crop. Uh, we hope to plant our cover crop after winter pasture graze out, which is gonna be April, May time period. We're hoping to graze these cover crops. We're just gonna have to see how they develop. If it turns hot and dry here, we may not have that opportunity, but if we get enough forage mass, we're, we're gonna graze them with stalker cattle. Our, our plan is probably to hold back some calves from the winter pasture to go on to the cover crops. So they'll be a, a little bit heavier calf, probably 700 pound calf on average when we turn out. Uh, we think, we don't know, but my plan is to, to graze the cover crop June through August, then we'll terminate it, come back in, either no-till or conventionally establish our winter pasture and repeat that for three, four years. Uh, a couple of other things that we're going to be doing while we're uh, collecting data for this study. In addition, I'm collaborating with a, uh, another researcher at the foundation that we're going out and we're looking at root structure of the winter pasture plants between till and no-till to determine if, if there are rooting differences based on tillage. And we also are cooperating with a, or collaborating with a, uh, another PI at the foundation where we're gonna be monitoring the soil microbial activity over time and see how, what the effect of tillage and the cover crop is gonna have on those communities. Another study that we have going on that we just started this past fall is, is a cow-calf 
winter forage system study. Um, if you're a producer and you have cows and calves, you know that <clears throat> the big cost of keeping that cow through a year is, is feed cost during the fall and winter. And for most of us, that's tied up in hay, and hay is expensive. If we can find methods, if we can find systems to extend our grazing period longer or to reduce or eliminate that, we should be able to increase our margins. So that's what this, this, uh, this experiment is about, is, is putting together those systems that we can evaluate to help us reduce those hay feeding costs. So we have three systems that we're trying to evaluate. And in our part of the world, our main introduced grass or forage is Bermuda grass. So this is all based on Bermuda grass. Our first one is just a control. Got to have something to compare these things to. Um, and it's typical of best management practice on Bermuda grass pasture. We'll soil test, we'll fertilize, we'll weed spray. We'll do all of those things that we normally do. We'll run those cows till we run out of grass, and then we'll hay and we'll supplement through the winter. The other one is, is I call it a stockpile interseed. We're allocating one cow, one acre per cow for Bermuda grass stockpile. And what that means is in the late fall, um, excuse me, in the late summer, early fall, we'll come into a, to our stockpile area, graze that down as tight as we can get it, apply some nitrogen, and then let it grow till frost. And what that does for us is we'll have fresh Bermuda grass forage. Typically, that's pretty good quality forage at that point. Um, we measured the, the, the quality of our stockpile areas this fall prior to turning our cows out, and it was averaging about 14% protein. Now, many times, that's a whole lot better than the hay we can put up. Um, we also have ryegrass in those stockpile areas, and then we're also allocating one acre per cow that we're interceding with wheat. So we have Bermuda grass pastures that we're actually going out and we're interceding with wheat. So the idea with the stockpile interseed treatment is that we'll run Bermuda grass pastures. When that's depleted, we'll move to our stockpile. When that's depleted, we'll go to our interseed. When we use that up, back to our stockpile area that's got ryegrass. When that's done, we should be back on Bermuda grass, hopefully. The third one is a stockpile winter pasture cover crop. Really, it's, it, it mimics the stockpile interseed, except interseeding a winter annual, we're not interseeding the winter annual into Bermuda grass, we're actually planting that into a crop area that's been traditionally uh, cropped. <clears throat> And we're also incorporating a, a, a summer cover crop into that stockpile area, I mean into that uh, uh, winter pasture area, clean till area. So we want, the objectives of this work is we want to evaluate forage systems that extend the grazing season and, and reduce hay and supplemental feeding. So we'll be tracking the amount of hay and feed that we have in each treatment. Uh, we want to measure the animal response so we're looking at cow body weights, cow body condition scores, reproductive efficiency, calf weaning weights, things like that. Um, and we want to evaluate the economics of each one of these systems. The way this study is set up, we've got 90 head in the, in the entire study group. Our treatments are replicated three times. We've got 10 head per replicate. Our cows, we started the cows on treatment after we weaned the, the springborn calves in October. Uh, we had a little bit of a, a snow event a couple weeks ago, so we, we turned our cows that were assigned to stockpile treatments onto those stockpile treatments. And the rest of our cows, our controls, uh, they began hay feeding on the same day, December 28th. Oops. Can you go back one or two, maybe? Okay. There we go. Uh, this is just kind of a, a, a map of our treatment areas so you can kind of see how things are, are laid out. Um, each of the different colors is a, is a different type of uh, one of the three treatments there. So 
we're totally, we're allowing four acres per cow. So this covers uh, a little over close to 400 acres out there on this one farm. A few pictures to show you of, of some of the activities that we had going on the fall, this past fall. On the left is, this is where we're interseeding our, our wheat, rye mixture into Bermuda grass pasture. Uh, we grew a lot of forage this year with the rain in the spring. So this pasture didn't, didn't look exactly like I wanted it to when we interseeded. But on the right is the stands of, of wheat and rye that we have coming up following that seeding. So I'm pretty well pleased with how that seeding looks. We haven't grazed it yet, but we will have grazable forage on it later uh, this winter. This is uh, the cover crop that we'll be using in our cow study. This is the same mixture that I showed you that we're going to use in our, in our calf stalker uh, study. We planted this in late July, <coughs> um, which was the first opportunity that we had after all the rains came through. I mean, we, we wanted to get it in earlier, but it just rained and rained and rained and we couldn't. We went ahead and got it planted. This is 22 acres and this is how it looked after we had 120 cows plus calves grazed it for two week time period. So about all that's left standing is some millets out there. These are some pictures that were taken last week. Um, the upper left corner there is our cows out on our stockpile Bermuda grass. Uh, down in that, that, we have a lot of rye grass coming up through there, and our cows are really maintained in body good condition very well out there on that stockpile pasture. They've been real content. A couple more pictures of, of wheat pasture that. Um, the one on the, one on the right, that's wheat following the cover crop that was planted. And then the one on the bottom left, that's wheat that was um, interseeded into Bermuda grass. So I don't have a lot of data to, to share with you right now, but that's what we're up to. That's what we're gonna be doing uh, this time next year. Come back and, and maybe we'll have a, a little bit more data and more updates to, to give you.